Coming up, spare the rod and spoil the child. Kansas takes a beating for proposing a bill to allow more forceful spankings. We examine that hard-hitting story. Plus, the Missouri Board of Education report on unaccredited schools is released. But what did we learn? We track the future of Kemper Arena, plus getting embroiled in the culture wars. Why J.E. Dunn is now joining Hobby Lobby in the legal fight over contraceptive coverage. Welcome, everyone. I'm Nick Haynes. Those stories and more coming up on Week in Review, dissecting the big local and regional stories on both sides of state line. The host of Up to Date on KCUR-FM, star columnist and UMKC journalism professor Steve Kraske. From 41 Action News, reporter Garrett Hake, Kansas City Star Development reporter Kevin Collison, and the senior writer for The Call newspaper, Eric Wesson. We begin in town where Kansas City, Missouri school officials expressed relief this week that the Missouri State Board of Education did not adopt a controversial plan that would have called for the near immediate state intervention of their district. Instead, the state board's long awaited plan for dealing with unaccredited schools provides a range of interventions for dealing with troubled districts, from putting them on short term performance contracts to appointing a new form of governance where a new school board could be appointed or even a new administrator who answers to the state education commissioner. Those districts that don't improve quickly will be designated as lapsed. Schools could be turned over to new operators, become part of a newly constituted district, or be parceled out to neighboring districts. So why, though, was the superintendent of schools all smiles following the release of the plan, Garrett? This buys him time. I think that everybody involved in this plan is making a bet that Kansas City Public Schools will have the results that they've been trying to get, that they've been saying they'll get by the time the next MAP scores come out in August to maybe regain provisional accreditation. This plan doesn't specify what that short timeline is. And for Dr. Green and for everyone else at KCPS, it gives them really till August to get their act together and prove that they deserve to be uh, left alone to do what they say has been working in the last few years. So this was a huge sigh of relief, Eric? Yes. Uh, basically, the plan that he put into place to deal with schools individually was something that they implemented. They threw the C-Trust plan out the window, basically. And it gives him an opportunity to prove and get the community support because there was a lot of community input. He had a lot of forms. People gave input. So he got exactly what he wanted out of the deal. Steve, I mean, look what was on the, on the line here, Nick. There was a chance that Stephen Green was going to be booted out of his job, the complete uh, entire Kansas City, Missouri school board was going to be kicked out of its uh, uh, collective offices. None of that happened here. Instead, you have a plan now where the State Board of Education is taking this sort of flexible approach, the, the district by district, That's those districts that are struggling, uh, a very individualized approach to uh, the problems that these districts face are facing. No wonder that Stephen Green was smiling after this thing was over. There was so much concern that the C-Trust plan was going to go into effect and this was going to be a catastrophe for the, for the school district. In fact, Garrett, you went down to New Orleans, in fact, and we're reporting this this week on a model there in New Orleans that is really the basis of what the C-Trust plan is going to actually be and put in place to try and rescue the district. Let's take a look at an excerpt from that report. The so-called C-Trust plan to remake Kansas City Public Schools borrows heavily from the Big Easy's big turnaround of what was once one of the worst performing school districts in the nation. Right before the storm, um, it was just a horrific education um, experience in New Orleans. The damage here along the Gulf Coast is catastrophic. Hurricane Katrina forced reform on New Orleans, shuttering schools and scattering students. The storm was seen by everyone practically as a way to kind of rethink what we do. So that there's, there is explanation here, it's not just like a one sentence? A state-run okay, recovery school district took over most of New Orleans schools and gave educators and charter operators control and accountability, serve kids better and grow fail and get shut down. Every other decision from hiring teachers to designing the curriculum and the money that make them reality goes to the school. Before the storm, roughly 75 percent of New Orleans students were in failing schools. Now that number is just 17 percent. Okay, some fruit was harmed during the making of that report. But Garrett, this was the revolutionary plan that we were expecting really for Kansas City. So why was there a pass on all of this? Why didn't we end up seeing this in Kansas City? It takes enormous amount of political courage to put a plan like this into place. In New Orleans, it took a hurricane. 
I mean, New Orleans had a failing school district for decades. They were struggling. There were, the FBI had a, had a desk in the New Orleans school district offices before Hurricane Katrina. But you had that city empty out. You had buildings that were completely shut down. They had a blank sl slate to build from. And what C-Trust liked about what they saw in New Orleans was you can have, you can have a, a great school in a failing district. So why not set the table to build great schools and forget the idea of a district. Start with great schools. And so they gave the option in New Orleans, the, the recovery school district, which took over all these schools, gave the option for anybody who had a good idea was going to come in and get money to try to build a great school. And the great schools kept going. Bad schools got shut down. Without a hurricane, and I asked this question to everyone I talked to in New Orleans, and I got different answers. Without a hurricane, without a big event to clear the table, it's very difficult to say we're going to take a model regardless of how it's working and completely scrap it for something new. Why didn't they do that here then? What, why did they end up doing something far more conservative, Steve? You get a sense, a very clear sense, Nate, that this was too big of a change, as Garrett is pointing out here, too big of a change for the State Board of Education to handle, much less a Kansas City, Missouri school district. Too much change at a time when, as we've talked about here on this show in the past, you know, stability has sort of begun to uh, creep into the Kansas City, Missouri school district for the first time in years. Too much change too quickly. Eric. I think those emails damaged C-Trust uh, credibility because you had, it looked sinister. It looked like they were up to something. And I think once those emails became public and people started dissecting, looking deeper, yes. they found out some money was being exchanged with people. I think that that pretty much killed it because it just didn't pass the smell test. Okay, we move on on our Week in Review. Do businesses have a First Amendment right to run their companies according to their religious beliefs? Hobby Lobby has been fighting the federal government over requirements in the Affordable Care Act that they provide birth control coverage to employees, particularly birth control methods that induce an abortion. The issue is expected to hit center stage next month when the Supreme Court begins hearing arguments in the Hobby Lobby case. But this week, the owners of Kansas City's J.E. Dunn Construction Company joined the culture war. They have filed a legal brief supporting Hobby Lobby. They say to be forced to provide emergency birth control, including the morning after pill violates their Roman Catholic faith. This is a pretty public stand here, uh, it's a very Kevin, public stand. for a company that doesn't necessarily want to have big public stands. And a company that does a lot of business, building hospitals, building other types of facilities that, uh, you know, this could actually, you know, come back to uh, haunt them in the way that contracts are awarded. So why are they doing this? Well, the Duns uh, do have a strong tradition, a very moral tradition. Uh, they, in their brief, they argue that uh, we give 10 percent of our pre-tax earnings to charity, mostly the Catholic Church, I believe. Uh, Mr. Dunn Sr., Bill Dunn, uh, the chairman emeritus of the company, uh, was quite outspoken a couple of years ago at the mayor's prayer breakfast talking about his views on what is uh, harming our culture uh, and very much a very strong, highly moral point of view on that whole front. Um, and, uh, you know, and ended up Mayor Kay Barnes the next year boycotted it because it, she thought it was too harsh. Uh, so they definitely... Um, have their bona fides on this whole thing as far as just, uh, the, and it is a family-owned company. On the flip side, you know, the argument is, are all the people working at that firm adhering to those same religious values? What about their freedom to practice or to follow their own moral compass? And it's a, it's a big crossfire issue, and the irony of all this, I get a big kick out of this, is one of the only reasons we're really hearing this is because Congress back in 93 approved uh, the Religion Freedom Act, or some, I, I'm not quite sure what the exact title, and that was in response to a couple of guys who had been fired from their job because they were doing peyote. And uh, they were doing peyote because they said that's part of our Native American <laughs> church. And uh, the Supreme Court said, no, this was okay for you to have been fired and you, you were correct in not getting your unemployment benefits because the laws banned peyote in general. It didn't just specifically focus on you on your church and your beliefs. So Congress then came in and said, look, you know, you've got, if you're going to pass laws that affects people's religious uh, practice, they've got to be narrowly focused. Now, rem Garrett. remember, this has already gotten a big national political airing. In August 2011, Governor Mitt Romney famously came out and had his argument that corporations are people, too. Said it at the Iowa State Fair and was lampooned for this. And this is kind of the macro version of that argument. This got a public airing, and it will get an airing, I think, probably at the Supreme Court level eventually. But traditionally, legally, the conclusion has always been corporations do not have these rights. A corporate entity doesn't have the same rights that a human being does. And remember that this conversation has sort of been going on for a while in all those different formats. Steve, it's such a great issue. I guess that's why the big boys and, and, and women of the Supreme Court are dealing with this issue. I mean, whose rights 
carry the most weight here? Is it the owner of the company or is it the employees in that company who want the same access to medical coverage as, as everybody else? What was interesting to me about Kevin's story is that he concluded by talking to a couple of constitutional scholars who both said that they think the Duns and that uh, Hobby Lobby, the, who's right. filing the suit, mm -hmm. are ultimately going to prevail here. That was their prediction, which sort of goes and contrary to And if that's the case, Eric does that allow then other businesses then to, to well, look at other types of law? that they can then That's say, precise. we don't have to ab abide by those laws. And what happens when we have the state of Kansas looking at the issue of service uh, to gay couples, for instance, exactly. and the wedding issue? As, as one minister I talked to uh, pointed out, you know, it is a very slippery slope. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got a situation, too, where there's another company in Peculiar called Sue Manufacturing yeah. that actually has an injunction. They denied all contraceptives to their employees as part of their health care insurance, which actually is the real Catholic doctrine on this. The Duns are just picking out part of it. If you really want to adhere to Catholic doctrine, then it's all contraceptives that are off the table. And there is various, it's, it's you know, people love to use the phrase cafeteria Catholic. Well, you know, the Duns are saying we disagree on the abortion front. However, we do see other contraceptives, and also there was an issue, and it's not as strong as Catholic doctrine, but the Catholic Church also teaches that nuclear weapons are wrong and, we, and encourages disarmament, and the Duns got a $400 million plus construction contract to build the new Honeywell nuclear weapons plant <laughs> in South Kansas City. So it's a matter of, you know, and this has been going on, it's like, okay, this is your moral point of view. Well, you're not really consistent here. And what about your employees again? You know, there's already a lot of concern being expressed by the scholars that the Obama administration has undermined its own position here by already offering exemptions and exceptions to charitable groups, nonprofit groups who objected to some of the uh, abortion-related provisions in this act. And so the, the thinking is that if exceptions can be made in some areas, why can't the Duns have their exception as well? So the, the argument here, the Obama administration administration hasn't done itself any favors. Jay Nixon still has more than two years left in his term as Missouri governor. So why is the race to replace him already getting so crowded? This week, former Republican U.S. Senate candidate John Bruner says he's interested in the race just days after former Missouri House Speaker Catherine Hannaway announced her candidacy for the GOP nomination. Republican Missouri Auditor Tom Schweik says he's also interested in running. Their presumed opponent would be Democratic Attorney General Chris Costa. So why this rush so early, Eric? Money. You get out, you intimidate people, you get your fundraising money uh, early, and you get into the flow of the race earlier. I think Costa is the only Democrat, and he jumped out almost the day after the last yes. election and said he was running, even though he's been running for the past six years. It's all about money, Garrett? Well, there's a couple of different things going on here. Politics abhors a vacuum, so the opportunity for these Republicans, where there's not one strong challenger who can clear the table, means anybody who thinks they can, you know, rub two nickels together and raise some money here can jump <laughs> into this race. It also says none of these guys are scared of Chris Coster, who, yeah, has been running for a very long time for that job, but it says they're not afraid of him. And I think, thirdly, it also shows how fractured the Republican Party is. You've got folks from every different wing sort of vying for what the future of Republican uh, politics might be in this state. You wrote a column in The Star saying it also doesn't help the Republican Party to have such a crowded primary. What a train wreck for Republicans, <laughs> Nick. Just go back to 2012. You had these three Republicans, including John Bruner, running for the U.S. Senate. Todd Aiken eventually won that primary. Look what happened there. A Democrat who was the decided underdog, Claire McCaskill, wound up winning that race because because the Republicans tore each other apart and spent so much money. When you're the Republicans, you don't have time in just the two or three months after a primary to re-raise all that money and challenge the Democrat, Nick. Uh, meanwhile, in Kansas, the governor's race is actually happening this year. Sam Brownback is up <laughs> for re-election, just profiled, by the way, by the New York Times. This week, a Wichita Republican businesswoman announces she's running against Brownback in the August primary. And part of her push is to reform the state's marijuana laws. Does Jennifer Wynn have a chance to win, Steve? No, no. Oh, okay. That was, that was very quick. Not Moving going on. to happen. Not on that platform either. Not in a Republican primary. Although no. maybe when she finds out how much Colorado's been making off of their tax on marijuana. That's an economic an development issue. Great economic and development. And you're all about economic development. I'm all about economic okay. development. Uh, but obviously Sam Brownback is running against a Democrat, Paul Davis, the House Minority Leader. Uh, he's always been viewed of as still a long shot for this. Have his, his fortunes changed any, Garrett? 
I don't think so yet. Uh, the Brownback's weakness is always that he was going to overreach. There's, you know, he's got Republican supermajorities in both houses. He can kind of do whatever he wants to. And what Paul Davis needs is for Sam Brownback to reach a little bit too far and to get a little bit more conservative than a very conservative state is, is comfortable with. And that will be his window, but it hasn't happened yet. Well, I disagree a little bit. I think uh, Paul Davis has got a two and five chance right now. Uh, Sam Brownback is still the decided favorite, but this state has made a big turn to the right. A lot of people still mm -hmm. Trying to wrestle with that idea, and uh, controversy doesn't uh, do incumbents any favors. Go ahead. Okay. The abduction and murder of a 10 year old Missouri schoolgirl shakes up Kansas City. He grabbed her, threw over him into the passenger seat, and took off. Alerts would not stop Tuesday night. They lit up phones, electronic billboards, social media, interrupted radio, TV broadcasts throughout the metro, but they weren't enough to save the life of Haley Owens, abducted just blocks from her home in Springfield, Missouri, in a crime drama that played out over the course of just a few hours. But why did a news event that occurred more than two hours from Kansas City so overwhelmingly impact the metro this week, Garrett? I think because it's every parent's nightmare. Amen. I mean, we, nobody wants to think we live in a place where a 10-year-old girl can't walk a few blocks home from a friend's house in broad daylight and not be safe. This was apparently a random abduction. Police don't believe she knew this person. Police, there's going to be a lot of questions about sort of what happened in these few hours. But relatively speaking, police acted fairly quickly. They knew a license plate number. They knew a house. The girl did what she was supposed to do and tried to get away, according to the witnesses who were there. I think it just shakes parents to their core that this kind of thing can, can still happen. But I do think there's some questions. I mean, the police had that license plate Very, almost, almost immediately. immediately yes. And it took, what, three hours for them to get to the house? Believe me, yes. if I got pulled over for a traffic stop on Shawnee Mission Parkway, they'd know where I lived immediately and they'd be able to find it. It just strikes me as being, it took a while for them to get to the, the site. The, the police timeline on this, which they released immediately, was mm -hmm. that they had the license plate, they, they, they traced it to the father's house. Apparently it was the, the car was registered to the father. Okay. Then they found that, then they were sent back to the house in Springfield where the, where the man who's now been charged with this crime lived, and the car wasn't there. So they were, they were, they were tracking down, but I, there is that question of between, you know, 4 o'clock when they had the license plate number, yeah. and I think it was 7 p.m. when police ultimately entered that house, you know, could they have acted faster? It is tough. To the say. Amber Alerts, it took two hours for that to be released in the multi-state area. P questions are being asked about that. Why did it take so long when they did know the model, the make of the car, the license plate number? Why would it take so long for that to actually happen? And does there need to be changes to the Amber Alert system as a result of that? I think it might be too early to come to that conclusion. I know the prosecutor in this case has already kind of come out and said he thinks the police really moved as fast as they could. There's sort of a, a system for how these Amber Alerts go out. And I think there's some nervousness to, to make it go too quickly that you have a cry wolf situation yes. where you're instantly issuing Amber Alerts and maybe people aren't paying as much attention. Eric. And I think in addition to all of that, it, it gave an opportunity for people to rehash some things, the Ann Harrison and with Michael Taylor trying to beat another execution, saying it's cruel and unusual punishment the way that they're doing it. I think people are over, not really oversensitive, but I think people react extremely well to situations involving kids being missing like that. I think, mm -hmm. I don't think that the police department did anything different. It probably might not have saved her. It might have, we don't know that. But I think that people's reaction to little girls or little kids, period, being kidnapped like that, yeah. I think it means And when you hear what it, happened uh, immediately lot. at the scene, it sounds like this was not a situation where people were paralyzed not to try to help this little girl. I guess they right. tried to chase down the truck. Uh, uh, yeah. it, you know, it, it certainly shows it. Uh, it. It certainly, the folks that were there did the best they could, and it's a tragedy. That's why we care about it so mm -hmm. much. A developer has stepped forward to try and preserve Kemper Arena and turn it into a mecca for youth sports. Fouch Brothers has announced a plan to buy the arena from the city and invest $21 million to transform Kemper into a youth sports complex, and they envision 1,000 kids a day going to the West Bottoms facility. But how does this gel with what we already know is another idea by the American Royal to tear down the facility and replace it with a smaller one better suited for agricultural it's, events, Kevin? It's a non-starter with the American Royal, that's for sure. And they've got an amazing lease that gives them control of that building through 2045. Uh, you know, so right now, the Fouches are basically pitching a project for property they don't own. 
Uh, the people who have control over its fate are absolutely not interested. And from what I'm hearing, the city's not all that engaged either with this effort. So it's it's a tough sell. And uh, It's a you know, fairly attractive offer, though. $21 million on the table. This is not something that anyone uh, should But could you at. envision it, though, as a youth sports complex, though, Steve? I guess I sort of could. And the, the traffic it might bring to the West Bottoms is kind of an appealing idea. That area needs a lot of traffic, and people go nuts over youth sports. So, sure. Okay. I, I think, the, you know, there's another issue, though, here. I do think the building deserves the historic, the National Register status it got. I mean, it is a unique piece of architecture. Mm -hmm. And I know there are a lot of people, there have been many ideas about how to save Kemper and repurpose it. And also, but the American Royal is insisting on a project that right now the city has no appetite I, for. And if it does get an historic preservation... Uh, it doesn't do anything. It, it helps. Then it with cannot the, be t torn down. No, it can be torn it down unless it gets be. local landmark status. The national status only allows it to be eligible okay. for historic uh, tax credits. But uh, the mayor also comes out this week and says he's not in favor of the youth sports complex idea, yeah. and he is in favor of what the American Royal is trying to do. But mm -hmm. I thought the mayor said it would cost so much of, of the city's money to actually do that concept, uh, and the, the city I, didn't have the money for it. I don't know, Nick. I, I, the last time okay. I talked to the mayor about this, it was a non-starter, or it was very much on their back burner. The okay. idea of a new equestrian center. I'm not convinced that the city needs another downtown arena right now. I mean, how many events are there currently at Kemper on any given week, on any given month? Uh, even at, as a youth yeah, sports man. complex, yeah. we have youth sports complexes in Overland Park. We have soccer in Swope Park. I yes. mean, we're sort of overbuilt. The Metro. Summit is now looking to build a massive new it, sports exactly complex. Exactly right. So there's a lot of ago. competition for that, uh, those dollars, that parent's time and attention. Right. And the Fouch brothers, God bless them, they've done some good work. They've re renovated some uh, a hospital. But this is a completely different kind of thing. And, uh, you know, you talk about the $21 million. Well, I don't know. I, can, I haven't heard any evidence to back up they've got that funding. It's just basically, hey, we think we got an idea. We can do this. But there's not been much vetting of this proposal at all. And then again, you've got a landlord and a tenant that are not interested in the deal at all either. But what are you going right. to do, though? Because no one, no, no one wants to push ahead with the American Royal, the redo, right. the tearing down of Kemper and redoing that building there. Again, the Kempers want to pitch in some of their own money. The city's saying, we don't have $30 million for that right now. So you have a bird in hand with the Fouch brothers. I don't know if you've got a bird in hand, well, Steve. I mean, they, I mean, I could, they uh, say there's they, a bird in, 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 in uh, the I got basket. an idea. Okay, I've got lots, a, lots of cliches. <laughs> Here. We're moving on here. More disturbances, talking about cliches, involving teens on the Country Club Plaza this week. This time, the police chief saying enough is enough. We're toughening the department's approach. He says this, and we've heard it all before. I thought we'd, we'd said all of this before, Eric, that we were going to be tough on this. Um, what's different? I think the city council did. I think the chief's approach, and I talked to him several times this week, is... The police were riding around with kids in their car waiting for the parents to come home. Uh, now it's like they're going to take the kids to a designated area, call the parents, say, come and get your kid, come and get your kid. And then after that, they would uh, stop telling kids so many times to stop doing this, quit gathering, quit running across the street like this, and then just immediately crack down. It, it gets back to the point that we, I've always said, parents need to step up and start being parents and send a mark that that movie theater out there, they need to start doing some things, too. It's interesting uh, you bring, uh, you know, I, I did a little, 10 years ago, Cinemark implemented a policy yes. in which kids over, between the ages of 6 and 16, had to be accompanied by a parent. They'd no right. longer show PG and P. That, pro, that policy lasted all of a, a year, I think, before they scrapped it. When you look at every one of these stories about the disturbances, it, there's a link there with Cinemark. But Cin okay, Garrett? The, uh, the rank-and-file police officers who you see down there also hate this assignment. And these, you don't go to the police academy <laughs> to come out here and babysit kids. Right. And it becomes a kind of situation where you're writing a curfew ticket. It takes you out of the, the night for a while. You're essentially babysitters. So I think that, that Chief Forte wants to, to toughen this up. And, uh, this has become a distraction. I mean, it's become something where his his men and women can't do their jobs, and if they can toughen this up and, and, and remove it as a political issue at least, but as an issue that takes up the time of these officers on a given Saturday night, that's a win for him. Steve? I get the impression this thing's going to stop. I mean, I think this a line's been crossed here. You, I know we've crossed it in the past. I think a lot of city officials are, not, are now saying, no more, it's going to end. But this gets back into our problem here where we don't have a police department that is accountable to the city councilman and directly to the mayor. And again, if this was another city, a councilman would have raised yeah, holy hell. There would have been know. steady, proactive police patrols 
to prevent this stuff from even okay. getting started. Could a Kansas lawmaker have come up with a solution for unruly teens on the plaza? A debate over discipline is erupting in Kansas. Have you heard about this? The state is looking into a new spanking law. You heard me, spanking. Not to get rid of spanking because it's perfectly legal there, but to let those who are doing the spanking spank harder. This week in Kansas, a Democratic lawmaker, not a Republican, introduces a bill that allows teachers, caregivers, and parents to spank children hard enough to leave marks. Representative Gail Finney from Wichita says she wants to allow up to 10 strikes at the hand, and that could leave redness and bruising. Have constituents in Kansas been demanding that? Well, apparently down Steve. in Gail Finney's district, someone's been demanding it, Nick, but I'm not hearing very much of a, a battle cry across the state of Kansas for it. Anybody, though, can introduce a bill in the state of Kansas, can't they? Yeah, and lots of people do so just to make a statement to appease a special interest, to appease a constituent who's been bugging them for a while. It happens all the time, Nick. This falls into the category, and I, again, you know, I cover economic development. This so area you know? spends millions of dollars <laughs> trying to promote itself. It just takes a handful of these goofy pieces of bills that are broadcast all over the United States and the world that undermines everything about the efforts to try okay. to make this area This more attracted attractive national place. news, plenty of attention on CNN and Fox News, but don't start fashioning your paddles just yet. The bill <laughs> late this week died in the House Corrections Committee. How will this affect fraternity? That is it for our <laughs> Week in Review. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.